Okay, so thank you again and welcome to the Disaster Action Team and Home Fire Response Communication webinar. Uh, the focus of this uh, next hour will be on the DAP program and our home fire response communication tools and resources that are available to support uh, regions in sharing the stories of our everyday mission of the Red Cross. Um, just to, uh, to take a minute about uh, to go over the housekeeping and some reminders. Again, this will be uh, going till 4 o'clock Eastern time. We have tried to mute all the lines. However, if you have a mute button, it doesn't hurt to go ahead and mute yourself um, given the large number of attendees. Um, please also do not put your phone on hold. Sometimes that will cause background uh, noise. Um, if you have questions, we'll ask that you post those questions into the chat box. And finally, we will be recording this webinar and uh, we'll aim to post that onto the exchange uh, shortly after um, the webinar in the next week or so. So um, next we'd like to do some introductions. My name is Alicia Guajardo and I am with the Regional Response Program at National Headquarters as part of Disaster Cycle Services and I have the honor and privilege to oversee the Disaster Action Team uh, program work and I'll turn it over to Nigel and Sam to introduce themselves. Thanks, Alicia. This is um, Nigel Holderby, and I am Director of Disaster Public Affairs here at National Headquarters, and I have the honor of working with um, a lot of our um, folks in the field, all in our communications teams, but also um, in providing some support to our disaster responders as well. Um, the DAT team holds a great, um, a huge place in my heart. I came from um, the original region there in Missouri and worked in Colorado, so have had a great deal of experience working firsthand uh, with our folks on the ground who are really the first responders in our home fire response. So I'm really excited to be collaborating with our response team um, to host this webinar. And Sam. All right. Hello, everybody. I am Samantha Taylor, and I am a training and operations specialist here at NHQ. I work uh, directly with NIGO with Disaster Public Affairs and have the pleasure of training our public affairs volunteers to work on disaster response and DAT response. And uh, I'm still fairly new, so still grabbing, uh, getting a grasp of everything and super excited to be here with everyone today. All right, so just a quick overview of the agenda that we are going to be using today. We are going to do an overview of the Disaster Action Team Program or the DAT program. We're also going to dive into the home fire campaign specifically around response. We're also going to touch on communications and how they collaborate with the disaster action team. And then we're going to cover some resources that are available to all of us here on the call. And we are going to toss it over to Alicia to get us started. Great. Thank you, uh, Nigel and Sam. So I'm going to take the next uh, couple of minutes just to give a high level overview of the Disaster Action Team program. As we were beginning the work on the program development, we um, wanted to know um, a little bit more about the Disaster Action Teams and some history about that. And what we discovered was that it was actually in 1964 that the American Red Cross passed a resolution that set the stage for the creation of Disaster Action Teams. These teams are specially trained volunteers and it was created to provide immediate assistance to individuals impacted by small scale local disasters. What was interesting is that prior to that time, the American Red Cross would not typically provide relief unless a situation included five or more families. The policy changed because the Red Cross realized that a significant need existed in situations with less than a national scope. So today, our disaster action teams really are our foundation, the building blocks of our disaster operating structure. Over 60,000 times a year, and thanks to more than 36,000 volunteers, Red Cross is there in those immediate hours after a home fire or other local disaster to provide compassionate care and comfort. It really does take a special volunteer who has that interest, availability, and 
and most importantly, the compassion and skills to respond at a moment's notice, day and night. So last October, the DAP program doctrine was released to the field to better support regions as they manage and build stronger, healthier, volunteer-led disaster action team programs. With the rollout of our first national standards for DAD, it's important to understand that our mission, of course, has not changed, but we are a better positioned to provide consistent, fair, and compassionate services to our clients, to create an enriched and more predictable and meaningful volunteer experience, to develop a sustainable volunteer-led program, and as regions adopt RCVU DAT dispatch, we will also integrate and align the new standards to maximize our effectiveness and the use of RCVU DAT dispatch. So what you see on the screen here is um, the disaster action team program structure, and it illustrates the organization of our DAT programs. It shows how DAT responders can rotate in and out of our response and program support activities, and they are positioned and organized into steady state program support and response operations at that chapter and territory level. If you're already not familiar with this, you can find on the exchange our DAT toolkit, and this really is the place for all things related to the DAT program uh, will be posted. There is an implementation update subpage where monthly updates and announcements are shared, and there's also a subpage for conference call information as well. Um, two brand new courses are getting ready to be released, the DAP fundamentals and DAP management. They are in the final stages of development. So one of the things to be watching for in the next couple of months are these two new DAP trainings. And we would encourage not only our DAT workforce to take the new training, but also anyone who collaborates with and supports disaster action team programs. So now we're going to turn our attention to the communications. We'll talk about materials and resources available, where to find them, and how to use them. Miguel? Thanks, Alicia. So one of the things that I, I love what Alicia just said there, and it's the collaboration piece. So we recognize from the communications perspective um, that we are going to tell the story. We want to make sure that we all know and are on the same page with what's the best practice. Um, there are a lot of ways to tell this story, and there are a lot of people doing amazing things out in the field, and a lot of this is, is happening. So this section is really focused on um, some tools and resources that are geared towards the communications team, but what I want us to really focus on is how we can work together to make sure that we are doing just that and being collaborative. So we do have all of the um, home fire campaign guidance that lives on the exchange, all of these materials. There is an entire section around the home fire campaign and all of the different resources that are available. So we really just are looking today at some of these high level, um, just tips and tricks and things that we want you to know when you're working in this space. A couple of things, this is a snapshot of the Topic Hub and you can see here um, that there's a lot of different information, but one of the things I wanted to highlight is as a disaster action team member in the field, you probably already work very closely with your regional communicators, um, but for some of those on the call who may not be directly connected, if you're not sure who your regional communicator is or who you would need to collaborate with in this space, uh, please feel free to reach out to Bobby Bishop or HT Link. They are the communications field support, um, and they would be your link to provide that. And as you can see here, that information is posted on the exchange, so you have access to their email and their information. So next slide, please. So how, how do we use the guide? And the guide that I'm referencing does, again, live on the exchange, and it's the home fire response or home fire campaign um, campaign guide. And this really does have a lot of different things. It really is a lot of specific information about uh, sound the alarm. So there's some very specific things in there, but it also has been updated recently to have some very uh, disaster action team centric focus and as well as really talking about how to tell the story of the response um, before, during, and after you're going on a disaster action team call. So a couple of things to highlight here. 
Um, there is messaging and style to make sure that whenever you're um, sharing statistics that you are talking about the things that have been approved. Um, as far as numbers, we want to make sure that we're all speaking from the same page. Um, this is a great way for collaboration with disaster. Um, communications and disaster work closely together to make sure that they're telling the story of how many responses are happening, how many volunteers are responding. And so again, the, I'm going to say collaboration quite a bit um, today, but that's something that we want to make sure that you all are doing. Um, some of the other things is the references when you're unsure of how we write about something or what we're looking for. Um, this is really something that the communicators in your region, your, your communications director, they will have all of this information handy, but I think it's a really good idea for us as communicators also um, to really go into this tool and look deeply to see how we are using it and make sure that we're familiar with um, the, base, the basic messages and styles. Next slide. So we use a lot of different platforms to talk about these things, and each of the platforms also has um, some style guidance and so some social media standards um, just that we want you to make sure that you're aware of is that we're um, really looking for these specific um, hashtags, some do's and don'ts around that, um, and an example of how um, the Colorado Wyoming um, team has used uh, Twitter to talk about home fire response as it's happening. So a couple of things, just a high level, our hashtag that we associate with home fire response is end home fire. So if you are on social media, um, you would have the opportunity to talk about this in such a way that you're a responder or you're the communicator. So you're using um, these tags to join conversations that are already happening. Um, I wanted to point out just one specific thing that the hashtag sounds the alarm is not the one that we would want to use um, simply because it is associated with another conversation that's outside of the one that we would want to be um, associated with. So just take a few minutes. If you're on social media, that we're going to talk about some of the resources, um, utilizing some of those resources for training to understand Red Cross guidance. Um, and we do have a course that is online called Social Basics. So we'll get to that in just a minute. Next slide. So these are, uh, again, communicators uh, have access to all of this information. Everything does live on the exchange. And whenever it's posted to the exchange in this form, these are all approved. So there are lots of approved resources to um, help promote the Home Fire campaign and uh, this resource um, specific to our disaster action team. We are working on, and I know Alicia has had some opportunity to work with some new resources that are uh, being, being built right now as far as some videos and some things of that nature. So we will be building more of these pieces and adding to this as time goes on. Next slide. So I talked a few seconds ago about some facts and statistics that live on the exchange. Um, and again, making sure that we are all on the same page and that we're using them properly um, and that we're using the right ones in the right spaces. These are some of the average, um, the, the example of the, the statistics that we use um, regularly. And you'll see these in different talking points. Um, these are standardized and we do update them from national headquarters perspective um, on the broad scope of things whenever they change. Um, but we're making sure to keep those up to date so that when you're out in the field and you're talking about this, um, that you are usual, using the same language that we're using across the country. And again, um, as these change, those would be changed as well. So I want to just invite Alicia to talk a little bit about that experience I said. Um, she was able to work with uh, Brad Theravitz in our video department to really capture some stories. So Alicia, could you tell us a little bit about your experience with the Georgia? Yeah, thank, thank you, Nigel. Yeah, so um, happy to share that. Um, just to kind of uh, bridge over from what Nigel's been sharing, you know, as we've discussed, you know, facts and statistics can certainly be used to highlight that important work that Red Cross carries out every day through our DAT responses. But certainly another very powerful method for spotlighting our work is through the storytelling. 
And so while many people recognize the Red Cross after those large disasters, it's often not the case for our local responses to those smaller local disasters such as home fires and, and other DAT responses. So it really is important that we all work together to raise awareness about the life-saving work of our disaster action teams and our home fire campaigns. So we'd like DAT volunteers to share stories about what DAT means to them. You know, stories like being willing to be woken up in the middle of the night uh, in, and to drive to some place that you've never been before um, in order to be able to provide that comfort and care to someone you've never met. So by telling their story, our DAP volunteers, they are also telling the story of those who have been impacted. So yes, uh, recently, um, uh, I uh, traveled down with our videographer and, and local photographers and others to, to really uh, have a chance to capture um, the great work that our disaster action teams do day and night. Um, you know, we, we see that our dad and our public affairs teams, um, you know, it's really important for them to work together. Um, and with completing the filming for um, in Atlanta, uh, we will be developing a, a video that um, spotlights on our disaster action team work, and it really will serve as a, a, a very powerful tool available to help us all tell our Red Cross story. So we will soon have not only that video, but an expanded, expanded library of uh, photos um, as well as um, all, of, all of the things that were captured um, to help you all tell that story. Thanks, Alicia. So when we're looking at our stories, um, how we're telling them, one of the things that I want to just throw in right now for all of our audience, we have a really broad audience today, so we know we have some regional communications folks, we have some disaster action team members, and so we want to really make sure that you walk away from this with, um, with an understanding of expectations based on your role. And again, working together in collaboration to ensure that we're telling the right story. And we know that stories should reflect a personal, authentic, and emotive tone. So we want to make sure that we're capturing the person's needs, um, the gratitude for the help that's provided by the Red Cross. And there are lots of different platforms that we can do that. Um, in the guide, um, there are lots of different um, ways that give you ideas about how to do this, but this is just a real quick overview of some of the things that are good questions, that are personal questions, um, to help people describe what's happened and explain why the services that were provided by the Red Cross were meaningful. Um, they, you, they may want to say a thank you and mention the Red Cross, and so you have to make sure that you are capturing that story from the perspective of what has happened, how is the Red Cross helping, and how has this help made a difference to the people that we've provided that support to. So once you have those um, questions, and there are some sample um, interview questions in the section of the guidebook that, um, that are in this part here, um, so you just want to take a look at that. But really, you want to make sure you're answering the who, what, where, when, why, and how, and really giving context to a photo or a video um, just with a quote that you've captured. Um, this is a great quote here from a DAT responder. It's not about the amount of money you give during a fire call. What people are going to remember the most is how they felt when you listened to their story and showed compassion. They will likely remember that forever. Um, that's a beautiful quote, and that really does have a very uh, touching way to connect us to the, not only the people that we're serving, but the volunteer who's there doing that service. Next slide. So along with um, the what and how you tell the story, we want to make sure that we're giving you some guidance on the best ways for, for capturing that. So for instance, with your photos, use the horizontal or landscape orientation. Um, take some photos with the limited space between subjects so it's closer together. Um, like this is just an example of a photo um, that we captured, just one of our volunteers captured um, and sent in to our Media 3 inbox. And it just shows that compassion between human beings and that care that's being, um, that's being provided. So always make sure that you are um, looking for Red Cross branding in your shots if possible. Think about the diversity in your content. Um, show the Red Cross 
in action, partnerships in action. And then we want to make sure that you're saving your photos to a high res, you want to do a high resolution. And, um, and then one of the biggest things we want to remind people is when you take a photo, we want to make sure that you're not photoshopping or making any alterations to the, to the photo. And I want to just um, dig into that just a little bit deeper. So if you're taking some photos and, um, and um, sending those to your regional communicator or your regional communicator and you're sending those into Media3, um, we just have to make sure that when we are out and we're capturing the story that we're also maintaining the trust of people and making sure that um, as an organization we're protecting our reputation. So we cannot Photoshop or alter the photo in any way um, because we want to maintain the transparency of that. And let's go on to the next slide. So this is another really important part about um, the publicity rights and copyrights. So Red Cross must own the copyrights to our content. And we have information release forms. You can download and print them from the exchange. You can also um, get them from the public affairs team in your region. Um, there are lots of places where you can get this information release form. Um, but it's really important that we have identifiable persons that are in a story, a release form that says that it, they give us permission to use their image, um, their quote, their photo in a video. Um, otherwise, we may not be able to use that content. And it happens quite frequently um, where we don't capture the information release form with the person. So it's really difficult for us to be able to put those together and that becomes an unusable photo if we can't match the release to the photo. So just a trick that works really well is to take a photo of each person that is in your, your photo collage in your story, have them hold their release form and then take that photo that goes with the set of pictures that you're either going to give to your regional communicator or you're going to send them to Media3. Really important that we have those signed release forms. You can save that, give that in a bundle to the person um, on the public affairs team for safekeeping, um, but those digital copies of that are really, really important. So the same thing goes when you're taking a picture inside a person's home. You have to have permission. You have to have an information release form. So this goes to our um, home fire campaign, to our sound the alarm installation program. So we're out in the field, we go into someone's home and we want to take pictures of the smoke alarm and the escape plan and it's all there on the table. We need to make sure that we are, are getting that release form to also share the information um, from their contents of their home, even if we don't have a picture of that person in the photo. Another thing to really keep in mind, um, these are used for a lot of different things, um, the photos that you all send to us. So if you avoid third party trademarks, it's easier for us to use those in a more broad reaching, um, more broad reaching, I guess. Um, I don't know that there's a, a, a there's better way to say that, but it's definitely um, easier if, if we were to use these in fundraising, there are different types of copyright releases that we have for each of these types of photos. And if there are third party trademarks within these photos, some of those cannot be used outside of just an ed editorial use. So just for instance, on a blog post that's talking about a specific response, um, something that we would say um, goes to the social media account or something along those lines. So make sure that you're keeping those things in mind. And again, these resources um, if you're trying to write this down or, or remember it, uh, these resources, all of this lives on the exchange within this guide. Next. So I mentioned this earlier. Um, there are a lot of different ways to share these stories and photos and captions. And so whether it's going on a blog post, um, whether it's going to be something that's used for Facebook or Twitter. Um, a lot of this content goes, um, you know, in a lot of different places, but throughout the organization, there are so many people that are looking for these stories. Uh, we want to make sure that we're providing that for them in a way that's shareable, um, that also, again, highlights the work that we're doing every single day. 
So our stories and captions and videos can all be shared with the National Headquarters Communications Department by emailing this email here, media3 at redcross.org. And any submissions, um, there's a, a definitely a way to put those submissions in where you have all of the information that we're looking for, the um, caption, the photo, and the information release form photo with that person so it can be matched. Um, submitted content may not all be used on a national platform, but we'd love to have the opportunity to tell that story um, again every single day. And these same photos, if you're in the field, if you're a DAP member and you're, and you're working with your regional communicator, they can submit the things that they feel would be really good and valuable to share with Media3. Um, and then they'll, they'll take those pieces that you've created and use them locally. Um, so those are some of the things that we do with your content, corporate materials, donor solicitations, and stewardship materials. Um, these are all things that you could help us with to tell that story more broadly. Next slide. Okay, so now I'd like to take just a couple minutes to talk about public affairs for our disaster action teams. It's not uncommon for media to show up on the scene during a disaster action team response, so it's important that all that responders have the basics of how to interact with the media and also be knowledgeable of the guidelines for photography and use of social engagement sites such as Twitter and Facebook to share a story. I do want to want to say here that um, it, this should, of course, never ever impact um, or delay service delivery. So that remains the first priority for our DAT responders. Um, so some some ideas and suggestions for um, uh, for our DAT responders and our public affairs and how we can work together. Um, for example, you could work with the DAT regional program lead as well as other DAT leadership to ensure that all of our DAT members have the resources to ensure consistency and helping tell the response story. You might hold a workshop for DAT members to do an overview of these basic public affairs trainings and help them understand the ways that they are able to help support the publicity of this aspect of Red Cross response. For recruitment, you could engage current DAP members in actively growing their team by helping them use their own stories to recruit new DAP members. You might also invite public affairs volunteers and staff to go along on DAP responses to observe and really see the great work that you do firsthand. Um, there are listed here on the slide a number of resources, so you can certainly refer to the Disaster Action Team Program Standards and Procedures in the DAP Toolkit. And as we've uh, mentioned a number of times, there are also some trainings as well as um, other information that all can be found on the exchange. Now I'll turn it over to Sam to talk more about media and publicity. All right, thank you. So there are a couple of things that you can do in order to engage media and kind of maintain that publicity um, surrounding the, the disaster action team and home fire response. So specifically before a home fire response, you can establish an on-call public affairs team and protocols to ensure timely notification of media uh, after a home fire. This can include recruiting and training media relations volunteers who are willing to be notified of home fire responses and take immediate action to post on social media and to notify um, media. Those could be some of those volunteers that you could also bring along on that responses so they have a good idea of what actually happens firsthand. Um, if you don't have any public affairs volunteers, you can train disaster action team members in the public affairs kind of policies and how to share and write that story. You can also download general fire safety tip talking points and the tip sheets and keep them in your to-go kit uh, to provide media on the, uh, that may show up on the scene. You could also establish protocol for timely notification of public affairs on home fire responses. So even if they don't go with you on a response, they'll be able to be notified of a response in a timely manner. You could work with your disaster team to ensure their response protocols include notifying public affairs as soon as the DAT has been dispatched, including steps to ensure that those volunteers or those PA members are updated um, as responses evolve so they can keep their story up to date. 
And they can also share on-call PA uh, phone numbers with the dispatch team or other disaster staff designated to notify public affairs. So even if, again, they don't go out into the field with you, that they are at least up to date on what is happening so they can continue to develop that story to help share the story that's um, unfolding. All right, next slide. Awesome. And there's also some things you could do after a home fire response, um, specifically posting to social media every time your local DAP members respond to a home fire. This content really drives excellent engagement with the day-to-day -day followers, and it's a very easy way to raise awareness of the sheer volume of our daily disaster work. We do get a lot of foot traffic on our really big non-daily disaster responses, and we also would like to get some of that really great pickup of stuff that we do every day. Um, posting as soon as possible will increase the likelihood that local media will pick up your response if they're covering the fire. Uh, it could be as simple as volunteers are responding to a home fire in a neighborhood or a city. Uh, we never give the actual address, so we just kind of leave it broad. And the, that has displaced a certain number of people. Again, we don't give names. And then we use the hashtag end home fires. Uh, you could also send a press release to media notifying them of home fire responses and responses in which we have provided assistance. In smaller media markets, uh, sending a press release has a high likelihood of garnering at least a little bit of media attention. Uh, once you get into the larger media markets, however, a daily press release may be too much and your news media may not cover the larger fires. But um, again, posting on social media is a really great way to just kind of share that story and it's also the quickest way to get it out there for people to read and see. All right, and I am going to pass it back over to Nigel, and she is going to carry on with some media. So a couple of things um, that we want to really highlight. Again, this is a collaboration, and so we recognize that there are, um, there are a lot of regions that already have some of this great structure. So we would just really encourage for those folks who already have some really good structure to share those best practices. Um, around some of these, the ways that we engage with media. And again, remembering the expectations based on what your, your role is day to day and um, making sure that the collaboration is there. Um, not that we're asking every single person on this call to do all of these things, but just that these are a lot of the things that either are already happening because the public affairs team is um, working on those things um, and just ways that you can engage. One of the things that we want to, and Sam mentioned this briefly, um, just wanted to really highlight today is there is new printed guidance in this, um, in this home fire campaign response guide around posting an actual address, um, being very sensitive with making sure that we're not sharing client details, sharing addresses in those posts online, um, that we're really making sure to protect the privacy of those who have just had their worst day. So that is some new guidance that is now in writing um, in this Home Fire Campaign Guide. A couple of other things that are really um, very sensitive, and that is our fatal fire processes, um, notification um, that you have a fatal fire in your region. Obviously, these are very, very sensitive um, incidents. And so we want to make sure that um, you're connecting with the caseworker for the incident as a communicator, um, making sure that you're able to connect with media that's covering this in a, an appropriate way, um, making sure that um, we also um, pr provide some protection for folks who have had their worst day when media may show up on the, on the scene. Um, perhaps they don't want to um, talk to the media, and sometimes that's an opportunity for um, for the Red Cross Public Affairs member to take that and, and really just high level share um, what the Red Cross was doing on the scene, but to make sure that that is done in a way that's sensitive. Um, there is specific guidance for um, telling a story around the fatal fire. Um, and again, working with your disaster action team, um, some of the follow up to this can be to make sure that you're talking about is there an installation event in the neighborhood where this death occurred? And how can we help get the word out about um, ensuring that people have working smoke alarms uh, and so that we can work to prevent this very, very tragic situation from happening in the future? So some of those are really good, but fatal fires are sensitive, um, obviously very sensitive. So you want to make sure that you're working with each other on those processes that you have in your regions for responding in those ways. Next slide. 
So a couple of things that are happening. Um, there are already conversations um, that are out there in the communities. And, and I wanted to just point out this example of a calendar where opportunities that the home buyer campaign materials are particularly useful. Um, a lot of the um, a lot of the regions have actual events around Martin Luther King Jr. Day. So there's the day of service. Um, a lot of these things are already conversations. And again, great opportunity for us to um, work together, um, particularly like with the April Volunteer Week, thinking about doing a blog post. If you're a DAT responder, um, how wonderful it would be to tell your story and really um, from the perspective of that 2 a.m. wake up call, um, what you're doing to serve in your community and, and really from the perspective of how we're supporting volunteers to say um, that we do a blog post around that volunteer that's responding or really highlighting the work of the disaster action team during volunteer week. So just some ideas we wanted to share with you. These conversations are already happening. Um, great opportunity to make some really good collaborative efforts for getting that story into those conversations. Next slide. Okay, we promised you some resources. Um, we do have um, a lot of different resources. On the national level, we do have redcrosschat.org, our blog, um, and the regions. You have blogs, um, you have those spaces, the, the um, social media spaces, um, all of those places. But think about um, if you've got a blog inviting first responders, um, city officials, people to blog about home fire safety, I just mentioned the opportunity to perhaps have one of the disaster action team volunteers to write a blog from that first perspective, first person perspective, um, to go ahead and, and share on your blog. These um, links are active here. We're going to send you after this um, after this webinar, we'll have a list of resources that have links to actively um, take you to these places that you can get these links. Um, the fire prevention and safety checklist, some really great pieces of information that are easily downloaded. Um, the just-in-time tools, talking points and graphics, the communications toolkit has this um, suite of localizable templates and resources to promote home fire campaign um, that does go year round. And then always look to the exchange for the most current information. And we are really actively putting um, the new information for sound the alarm um, that will be coming out in the next few weeks for a lot of the things that we're talking about today. So I think at this point in time, um, we've covered a lot of a lot of information today, but we do have some time remaining here for some questions and answers. So Alicia, I will turn it back to you um, to take over that question and answer section. Okay, great. Thank you so much, Nigel. So we're looking at the, the chat box now. And what I'll do is I'll go ahead and read them out. And I think probably um, a majority of these are going to be for you, Nigel, and Sam. Um, so, but let me start. Um, there was a question, a general question of whether the webinar um, is being recorded um, so that it can be shared after today, and the answer is yes, we are recording it. And as soon as we're able to get that together and get our re the resources, I'll post it, we'll post those to the exchange. Um, another question was um, the actual title of the guide um, that you've referenced, um, Nigel, if you could clarify what that is so they can make sure they find that. Yes, it's the Home Fire Campaign Communications Guide. Okay, great. Uh, let's see. So another question is, um, do we need to uh, get a release for pictures of damaged structures? So this, this is, um, I think somebody is um, putting a trick question in here because when you're working inside someone's home, you do want to make sure that you have an information release form. So I recommend that you get the information release form if there is someone on site, if you're working with the homeowner, just to make sure that, that, um, that, that you're covered on that. It's not something that we would require um, or that we would need to see specifically, um, but if we're going to use that photo and share that image of someone's home, if it's recognizable, a couple of things that I always try to look at is making sure that 
when you take that photo that there's no recognizable um, home address, the numbers on the house, those types of things, somebody's car, make sure that there's not a car in the driveway with their license plates and those sorts of things. Um, but as far as just showing damage, no, we don't necessarily need to have an information release form for that. Okay, another question is more of a technical one in terms of uh, the photos. And the question is um, uh, about cropping for size if you're not changing the content, and if that is okay. Yes, photos can be cropped, uh, so that is not adjusting. Um, and, and there are some times when there's a person, you know, that maybe it doesn't fit in the frame and you want to make that smaller. So that is appropriate. I always um, like to steer on the side of not making any adjustments at all, especially if I'm going to be sending that to the media3 at redcross.org, because those changes and adjustments can be made um, to fit. Uh, without, and, and sometimes it changes the resolution if you try to make an adjustment to the size um, and then it doesn't stay in its high res um, form and then it becomes an unusable photo. Okay, great. Um, so in speaking about the, the releases, um, the question is, um, are these releases needed when taking pictures of volunteers on um, the DAT calls or on sound the alarm events? Yes, so there are a couple of things that I'm going to steer people directly to their regional communicator to if they have a specific question about that to check with their regional communicator because there are a couple of things that are different. Um, the, the larger events where there's a bunch of volunteers and there's a lot of people doing this, this thing, um, there is an opportunity where the regional communicator may post a sign that says your photo may be used and, and shared. Um, if we're just cataloging that event, we don't necessarily need to have those because we're not doing any, we're not doing really any um, fundraising or uh, promotion with those photos. So if you have a um, volunteer that is on the disaster action team and you're out and you're taking photos, you do need to have an information release form signed and be able to match the photo um, because if that's going to be used, you know, say you're sending that to Media3 or you're using it somewhere, um, we want to make sure that we have permission in that moment by that volunteer um, to capture their image to tell this story. Um, I've worked with a lot of different volunteers who don't necessarily want to have their photo taken. And so these are things that we uh, really need to be respectful of, but yes, we would in those two situations, there are some um, nuances. So I would encourage you to reach out to your regional communicator for uh, some really, really direct guidance around each event. Okay, let's see. Um, so the next question uh, is um, actually expressed as a concern about asking families who have just experienced the death of a family member if they want to talk to the media. So if you could speak to that. Sure, and, and again, that is a very sensitive situation. And um, I'm gonna take this from the perspective that we are there to provide them with the compassion and help that they need. We are not there to connect them to the media. Now, from experience, I've had situations happen where I, I was put in a situation where they, they didn't want to speak to the media, so they came to me and said, can you please talk to the media? And, and they just asked for their privacy. Um, so as the Red Cross public affairs responder on the scene, that becomes a, a space where you would kind of manage the media for that family sometimes. So I don't believe that, um, you know, if we're on scene, it is not our role as Red Cross to step in and be setting up interviews with people. So we really want to be very sensitive to that. Okay, thanks, Nigel. So we're, we're getting close to the end of our time, so I want to just uh, ask again if you've, you do have a question, if you can put that into the chat box, that makes it easy for us to, to see the question and you can just send that to the host. Um, let me see um, if we've got any more that have come in. Um, 
So there's a question around um, if we see uh, perhaps in the future there being a time of uh, where we would submit a photo when entering the event in CAS. So this is I think speaking specifically to the stat responders. Um, I don't know, Nigel, if you have an answer for this this one or not. So actually, with the use of RC View and RC Collect, um, you know, we have some of these capabilities on a larger disaster, so that may be where this question is coming from. I can't speak to the future or what that program um, might entail for home fire, but I do know that that's a, a platform that we are looking at all of the different ways that we can help communicate the story of what we're doing, um, not just on large scale disasters, but every day. So we will definitely, um, I'll take that back for um, just an action question on this side. Um, and if they're, you know, just keep an eye on that space with RC View. That's definitely a place for us to be able to have that capacity in, in some point. Great. So um, someone has just posted that they were searching for the Home Fire Campaign Communications Guide on the exchange and they can't find it. So could you explain again kind of the best way to find um, not only the guide but other related uh, resources? Sure, I'd be happy to. So if you go to the exchange and um, open that up, and if you type in the search home fire campaign, and I'm gonna do this just so I get it right and don't tell you guys wrong. Um, there is a home fire campaign toolkit that was updated February 19th of 2019. And there is um, information here. This is where that information about contacting Bobby and HT in the field. It has the statistics. And there's a communications and content guide. There's a link right there. So I apologize. I missed the word content, but it is um, home fire campaign communications and content. It was updated February 2019. Nigel, if you're at your computer, you might um, uh, just uh, add the link into the chat box if folks oh. wanted to grab it from there as well. Perfect. Yep, Sam's doing that right now. Okay, so one other question just came in. So what is the best way for us to find photos of disaster volunteers providing service? That is a great question. Um, the photo library is full of photos of disaster volunteers of different, um, different levels and different disasters. And I'm pausing here because I'm pulling this up. I'm gonna give you the how to find that as well. Um, but you do have to um, gain access. So you have to answer a series of questions to get access to the photo library. Um, but also work with your regional communicator. Um, they will be able to help get that for you as well. Uh, but you can do a search for the Red Cross photo library. Um, that was updated. The title for that topic hub is photography, and it provides you with information about the Red Cross Photo Library. Okay, thanks, thanks, Nigel. So we're coming up on the hour. So I'll give it one last um, round. If you've got a question, if you could put that into the chat box. In the meantime, um, I'll just remind everyone on the call that we are recording this webinar and we will uh, be posting that um, very soon onto the exchange along with a number of uh, links to the resources that we've been talking about throughout the, the webinar. If you've got questions that are specific to the DAP program, you can email me uh, directly at alicia.guajardo at redcross.org, or you can also send that to dat at redcross.org. And for communication, um, you can reach out to Nigel directly, and her emails on the slide, um, or anything related to communications and training, reach out to um, Sam at samantha.taylor at redcross.org. So any final questions? I don't think I'm seeing anything here. Um, Nigel, I'll turn it back over to you if you've got any final comments for our group today. 
Thank you so much. I just want to just say a big, huge thanks um, to our partners in response for working together with us on this and to you, you all who joined the call today. Um, this is a really, really important story. Um, it's one that we really want to make sure that we're doing our best to highlight and, um, and you guys are the ones out there in the field that are making that happen. So thank you for all the work that you do every day. And as Alicia said, feel free to reach out to um, myself or Sam if you do have any questions that we can help you with. And we'll look forward to talking with you again. Okay, so one final thing, I know I mentioned this, but I just want to say it again, knowing that we have likely a lot of our, our DAT responders um, on uh, the webinar today, to just remember that while it's important for Red Cross to tell the story, you know, if you are a responder, the priority should always be on safely responding and certainly appropriately helping our clients and being respectful and sensitive to their situation. So thank you again for all that you do every day and night, every single day of the year, and thank you for joining us today.